Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about the top 5 tiny tips that you don't need to know in Age of Empires 2. That's right, these tips don't matter. You don't need to know these tips to play at a high level in Age of Empires 2. And uh, yeah, they literally make no difference whether you guys watch this video or not as far as your knowledge of AB2 goes. But since I know these things, I might as well do it and that's the only reason I'm making this video. Alright, real quick though guys, I just launched a Patreon. So it's a new platform you guys can support me on and it's actually really cool. I put my build orders on there so you can go there and subscribe on Patreon instead of going on Twitch and linking it on Discord and that whole hassle if that works better for you you can go there also for different tiers i also have like campaign videos that i'm planning on doing since i also love the campaign and then i'm also having a tier where you can ask me all kinds of aw2 questions and i have a lot more exclusive content there that i can get into for hours so go ahead and check it out the link in the description below on patreon all right now back to the video but actually i baited you because before we start just going to do a quick shout out to the tournament i'm hosting the champions invitational some insane games have come so far i'm posting the videos in those long best of 21s on youtube so you guys can watch them there or you can come on down to my twitch channel twitch.tv slash Hera and come watch the action live as I'm going to be playing and casting the event I'm hosting $7,000 the best players in the world fighting for the crown of who is the absolute the number one best player in the world currently in this game let's go ahead and hop right into list for real now Alright, starting off at number 5, and remember, none of these tips actually matter, so keep that in mind when you're watching this video, it's going to help you a lot in trying to process this information. So if you right-click an enemy villager with a mangonel, you will actually kill it in one shot. However, if you attack ground the villager, it will always survive, no matter how precise your attack ground shot was. I literally don't know why this happens, I think Spirit of the Law, the goat of YouTube, has a video on it, but I'm not 100% sure if he covers this exact topic. But yeah, for whatever reason, this works, so if you're having a mangonel and you're trying to attack an opponent villager, always right-click the villager do not attack ground unless you're trying to hit multiple villas but if it's one villager always right click him you'll kill him in one hit assuming the villa doesn't move if you attack ground you'll never get him so yeah yeah i guess it's good to know this one Moving on to number four, we've got a little bit of a cheesy strategy and I'm gonna help you out a little bit with your villa laming farm specifically. So if you have a forward villager and you're attacking a villager of your enemy on a farm, what you can actually do as you're tower rushing him or whatever is actually attack the enemy villager that's farming next to his town center once with your villager and then immediately deleting the farm. That way you take the enemy farm, delete it, and so he's got no farm and you just move on to the next one. Such a cheesy tactic. It's so annoying when people do this, but it's such a passion of mine to do this to my opponents. It just brings me so much joy to take all their farmers away with a single villager and I can feel the pain and frustration flowing through their veins in game of course and it just feels really nice to do this so it's nice for you guys to know if you ever got a forward villager hit the enemy vill once take their farm delete it and you can I don't know type something in all chat to tilt them further just kidding don't or or, or do it's up to you really all right, moving on to number three, I've got a very small tip to help you out with your wood villagers and specifically your early game wood villagers. Now this basically doesn't matter, but because I do this every game with my villas and it helps you a tiny bit, I might as well pass it on to you guys as well. If you have a wood situation, you make a lumber camp and there's trees behind it, you can actually click the trees right behind the lumber camp with your villagers. The way you do this is you position a villager right next to your lumber camp and then you right click the tree that's diagonal to him. That's the one behind the lumber camp and he can chop that. The reason this is really good is that it makes Makes them walk zero tiles to drop off the food uh, drop off the wood excuse me it's really efficient and it gets you the best lumber chopping of course it's a fraction of an advantage it's a very small bonus to your wood economy but it definitely helps to do this every game you get a little bit more wood than your opponent and your bills will actually work better and bump less if you do this as well which is a nice added benefit to using this trick an extra bonus for your lumber camp is you can actually shift click villagers on your wood line to make sure they're always working perfectly efficiently how this works is that you select them to chop one tree and then you shift click them to chop the next tree and then so when they're done with the first one they'll automatically go to exactly the second one you commanded them to this is really good because villagers in this game are super dumb and so they'll do whatever they want usually something bad if you don't micromanage every single one of them so it's very important to kind of babysit the villagers and make sure you're, they're chopping exactly the right tree to keep them super efficient once again this doesn't matter so if you don't want to do this literally don't it makes very little difference Moving on to number two, another little small tip, this time to do with some towers. So if you or your opponent walls in a tower, you can actually still eject the unit inside. What happens is they're gonna eject and then be on top of the tower. It's gonna look super glitchy, but we can actually abuse this little glitchy situation, especially when we wanna repair the tower. Picture the situation, we vault in the tower, enemy tower is also hitting it, and he's got some melee units nearby. So we can't just get out and repair it normally. We've gotta stay inside the tower. So we eject the units and we can repair the tower while being literally on the tower. This means 
means the enemy melee units cannot hit your villagers and you can just simply repair it in peace. It's also very hard for your opponent to target your villagers with range units when you're doing this because they're literally all on the same tile. So he can't distinguish one from the other. Half the time, if you do this, your opponent won't even realize what you're doing. You're basically bug abusing, but it's not a bug. It's a feature because it's been there for 20 years. So I'm going to take advantage of it and I'm going to complain when my opponent does it because that is the way we deal with these kind of situations. But it's a nice little thing to know. It can help you out in the tower wars whenever that goes down. All right, before I show you guys number one, though, I've got a quick honorable mention. I think it's a really cool one. Most people know about this, but I threw it in just in case people don't. But it's basically the fact that you can block the damage of fire galleys or fire ships just by putting something in front of them. So, for example, if there's two fire galleys fighting each other, yours versus the opponent, you can put a fishing ship of yours in between. What that does is that the fishing ship will tank the damage of the enemy fire galley. It's basically the only unit in the game that works that way, where it's damage. It's basically a projectile. It's not something that goes from point A to point B. B. It's something that travels and does damage from point A to point B. And the important difference is whatever it hits in that trajectory and that travel, it's going to deal damage to. So think of it like a scorpion, but that doesn't pass through units. It just hits the first unit it hits, and that's the way it goes. So the fire galley basically will do damage to the fishing ship and will do no damage to your fire galley, which is behind your fishing ship. And so in this scenario, it's really good to get an advantage in the early fire galley versus fire galley fights just by putting in a unit between them. But we can go a step further and we can put a building between them. So if you position right behind your dock, and your opponent is fighting you, you can actually angle it so that your dock soaks up the damage. This is really overpowered, obviously, because the dock has 1800 HP, so it can tank for literally ever. So if your opponent doesn't know what you're doing, you can get some really cheesy advantage by using this trick. All right, finally, the moment we've all been waiting for, the most useless tiny tip that you don't need to know in Age of Empires 2 is at number one of the list, ringing the town bell. Oh, wait, what? Isn't that bad? Everyone tells me not to ring the town bell. Bro, I watched T90 on weekends, and he always says ringing the town bell is something that they do in Loyola Legends. That is all true. Ringing the town bell usually sucks. That is a good general rule, but with just one civilization in the game, it's actually really good in a last resort. And comment down below if you can guess what civilization this is. You're basically 200 IQ if you can guess without cheating. So go ahead and comment right now to try to guess. But the civilization that it actually makes sense to ring your town bell with is the Khmer. The Khmer is super good with the town bell because your villagers were garrisoned in houses if you ring it. And that's really good in the last resort because you can go ahead and be raided in 20 different areas, ring the town bell, all your villagers jump into town centers and houses and they stay 100% safe. And then if you eject it, they actually go back to work from the houses. So it's a really, really nice tool to use with the Khmer. And usually the problem with the town bell is that your villagers will garrison the town centers and the castles. Some that are safe garrison it, some that are, you know, in danger garrison, but oftentimes there's no space for everyone and villagers are just kind of garrisoning in random areas. Whereas with Khmer, because you've got those houses, they always garrison somewhere nearby. And so you can garrison and then ungarrison them all real quickly in a last resort situation. And it only makes sense with Khmer. And I've actually done it a couple times in pro games and it's worked just fine for me. All right, that's going to do it for this video, guys. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed these top five tiny tips. Uh, I actually really enjoyed making this one. So if you guys did enjoy it, like, comment, and subscribe to see more. And uh, yeah, that's going to be it for me. Take care and bye for now.